Well, welcome, Calvary. Welcome to part three of our six part series flesh Jesus in and through us it's so good to have you here this morning to see y'all in person for those of you joining us online I'll welcome you again I feel so inadequate following up Pastor Kareem and Pastor Chris even when they do announcements I feel like Kareem somehow preaches a message that has people uh run in the aisles through announcements so I'm not quite sure how I'm going to top that but anyway we're going to jump straight in today because we've got lots to cover such a good word today grab your Bibles Turn with me to John chapter 8. In this series, we're taking a few weeks to dive into the question, what does it mean to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this modern world? We hear that all the time, right? We just need to be the hands and feet of Jesus. But how does that practically look in our world today? What does that mean? What does that look like? In week one, we noted that the early Christians didn't have the luxuries that we have here today, right? They had no electronic means of communication, no cell phones, Twitter wasn't a thing, Facebook didn't exist, there was no social media, no finely tuned marketing strategies, no financial finesse, no constitutionally protected right to free speech, but they did have what they had at their disposal. The one thing that many of us are prone to forget, what they had was the presence and the power of God Almighty living in them living through them, among them, desiring to live out through their lives. And it was their church growth strategy. That was it. That was it. That was what they had. It was incarnation. Jesus borrowing their skin to accomplish amazing things by grace through faith. And I think we tend to overcomplicate things too often. Jesus had promised that he would build his church. He would do it. And then he invited them to participate with him as branches rooted in the vine, bearing fruit for the world to see. And on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit of Christ filled those believers and the church was born. That's where it started. And we said that, in the, that this is the essence of what it means to be incarnational in the way that we live. Trusting Jesus to use our unique blend. Our unique blend of what? Of our personality, of our giftings, our gift set, right? In order to manifest his presence in and through us. Then last week, we focused on reputation and the fact that our street cred, as Pastor Kareem said, as Christians, have, it's really taken a beating, especially recently in the, rest, in the Western world. We said that we need to get back to the way of Jesus, how he went about functioning, living. We saw that Jesus lived his life with a positive reputation among common folks, not necessarily among the leaders of the law. They despised him. But among the common population, they loved him. They were drawn to him. Why? Remember, he was just an everyday guy. He was a friend of sinners, right? What did he do? What was the pattern that he lived? We learned last week. He, he did it through being normal, redeeming our vocations as the mission field. We too often try to split this whole world of our work into secular and sacred. Ministry is sacred, but I have a secular job. That's not true. That's not true. If God called you into what you're doing, it's sacred. That's sacred. That's your world of influence. Also, we have to pick the right fights right? Remember why we do what we do. Stop getting distracted with the stupid, frivolous stuff. Remember, pick the right fights and be a true friend of sinners. Now, Jesus was called a friend of sinners, but when he was called that in his day, we learned last week, that was the insult of insult. It was, he was down in the muck and the mire with people that were not desirable, but Jesus loved it. He couldn't wait He'd be the one sitting in the bar with the drunks. He'd be one on Harry Hines talking to the prostitutes. I mean, right? He saw the people that needed good news. And he was attracted to them, and they loved him for it. They loved him for it. So if you've missed any of these 
messages in this series, hop online, download the app, visit the website, get yourself caught up. But today I'm excited to share about this next area of focus because it's really where we start to gain impact in the world today the same way that Jesus did. And you'll see on your notes on the Calvary app how once we begin learning to live incarnationally, to develop a trustworthy reputation will affect everyday people. The everyday people that God has called us to. Our mission here at Calvary is to declare and demonstrate the gospel to everyone, every day, everywhere. Who's the everyone? It's the people in your sphere of influence. It's the people you interact with under the roof of your home, under the job responsibilities, your neighbors, the people in your community, down the street, next door, your friends, your families, your enemies. They're the people you interact with. God will give us opportunities to start speaking about him through some great natural conversations. We complicate this whole journey so much. When God is like, I, I create opportunities for you all the time to just strike up conversations about how good I am. That's what he wants us to do. Because then that will lead us to an eventual confrontation. And that's what we're going to focus on today. And don't let the word confrontation scare you. Don't freak out. Because I'm not talking about being rude. I'm not talking about being nasty or confrontational with people. Because that's what we think of when we say confrontation, right? It's getting up in someone's face. It's what we've seen all over CNN and Fox News. It's this weird reputation that we in the church have grown to have. It's the standing on the street corners with billboard signs over our bodies, throwing tracks at people saying, flip or fry, turn or burn, you're going to hell. <laughs> like, tell me, how many people are going to be like, oh, sign me up, I don't want that. That sounds so good. Thanks for caring about me. No one. No one is attracted to that. I, I will walk down the street. When I'm a tourist in another city and someone is standing on the street corner and they try to evangelize me, and I'm sitting there going, stop, just stop. Right? I'm simply talking when I say confrontation. I'm simply talking about the pursuit of gently guiding people to the crossroads of their need to make a decision with Jesus. Believer, we've all been there, right? It's leading them to the awareness of their need for Jesus in their lives. In your journey of life, in the journey of faith, you all came to a point where you realized, man, I've messed my life up. For some of you, it didn't take very long to come to that realization. For others, it was a long process. But eventually you made a decision. You came to the realization of a confrontation, right? Throughout the ministry of Jesus and the apostles, they were all about bringing people to the place in their lives where they honestly could admit their need for a savior from their sin. And the Bible speaks often about the need for new life, for spiritual rebirth, right? It's what we say being born again. It's just new life. Here's the deal, even though we know that this moment needs to come, we in the church have tended to move toward this confrontation quite recklessly with people. We're often known for quickly condemning sin publicly, even calling out certain sins as worse than others. Think about that for a minute. Think about it. We are quick to broadcast everybody's news publicly. And in many of our Christian traditions, we're encouraged to speak to people with whom we have no relationship with, that we have not earned any trust, we have no street cred with them. And what we find is that not only does this rarely work in helping people discover Jesus, but more often than not, it's, it contributes to our lousy reputation. Because we're viewed as pushy, as narrow-minded, as rude, just flat out. Rude people who want to cram our beliefs down everybody else's throats. So there is such a thing as good confrontation, but there is also such a thing as not so good confrontation. And what we finally get to see today is that Jesus has not given us a ministry of condemnation for people, but rather reconciliation. Get that. Because we have 
translated this, I've got to go out and evangelize, as I've got, I'm going to go out and condemn people. And that's not what we've been called to do, ever. We have been called to reconcile people to Christ. To break that divide. And tell them that there's a good Savior out there who desperately loves them so much. What we finally get to see today is that Jesus has not given us that condemnation call. He wants us to learn to walk with people like he did. In his timing, with positive confrontation. And that positive confrontation will happen as we converse with those who have earned the right to be heard through our love. In fact, there's a question for you to think about today. I'm going to ask this. I want you to ser seriously, sincerely think about this question. Do you actually live with the conviction that God loves people infinitely more than you ever will? Think about that. Because oftentimes we think we, I mean, we're God's last hope. I mean, we seriously, it's our responsibility to get the whole world saved. But think about this for a moment. Think about it. As a parent, there's nothing I want more than to see my children have a relationship, a true, genuine, authentic, sweet relationship with the Lord. And as much as I want that, God wants that even more. I don't need to stress about it. I don't have to stress because God wants it more. He will do what needs to be done to speak to their hearts exactly where they're at. I have family members who don't know the Lord. And God will do exactly what needs to be done to speak to their heart in tender, sweet ways. That takes the pressure off of me. I just simply get to be a part of the ride. I get to simply tell them about the sweet nature of Christ. What a thought. God wants to save people far more than what we want to see for them. Again, that takes the pressure off of us, and it allows us to function more like gardeners than salespeople. Think that one through for a minute. We are called to be gardeners, to tenderly care, not salespeople looking to close a deal. Before we briefly look at John chapter 8, let me remind you of something that the Apostle Paul, who I personally think was probably the greatest evangelist ever, he wrote about helping people discover Christ and enter into God's family. Paul never, ever, not once, ever used the analogy of closing a deal when speaking of bringing people to Christ. Never. Because that would mean that people are just commodities. Right? He never used sales and marketing terms as an analogy of our mission in life. Instead, he used terms of horticulture. For example, in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, he said, I planted the seed. Apollos watered it, but God was the one who makes it grow. Now in John chapter 8, we come upon this famous story that we briefly mentioned last weekend, and the story is the woman caught in the act of adultery. Okay, so beginning in verse 2, we're going to read through this. Some of you may be very familiar with this story. Some of you may not. For those of you that are familiar, don't check out. I know you could probably tell me the whole story and recite it and tell me all the meanings. Just track with me for a minute. John 8, 2 through 11, it says... And at dawn, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? And they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, Let any of you, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw the stone at her. Again, he stooped down onto the ground and he wrote. And at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. And Jesus straightened up and he asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she, she responds by saying, no one, sir. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and leave your life of sin. 
So let me try to set the stage for the story so that you can apply the power of this story to your life, to our lives today. The Jewish Feast of Tabernacles has just ended in Jerusalem, all right? Jesus wakes up early the following day and he goes to the temple courts where he, he begins to teach some of the worshipers who were lingering after the festival, okay? These are the people that at a party, they need to go home, but they don't want to, so they're still there. They're hanging out. Jesus comes on the scene, and just as we read, right in the middle of all of this, Jesus starts to teach them, right? The Pharisees, the law teachers, drag in this woman in front of the crowd, and they use her as a prop in order to trap Jesus. Get the picture. They're in an open area. They drag a woman who was caught in the very act of adultery. We read through these passages so often, we just kind of skim through, and we don't really think about it. Imagine this happening today. She was caught in the very act of adultery. She's pulled in, probably not dressed, or if she was, not appropriately. She's probably completely ashamed fully embarrassed, and they drag her, making a mockery and an example out of her in front of all these strangers, and there they are ready to do her in. Okay? It was well known that the sin of adultery was a serious offense under the Jewish law, but it was also the case that these religious leaders decided that they were going to bend the law by dragging this woman in by herself. Because according to the Leviticus and Deuteron according to Leviticus and Deuteronomy, the law of Moses states that both the offending man and the offending woman must be brought in to be judged. Hmm, interesting to me. Where's the guy? Where's the man? Not there. He's nowhere to be found, but she is. In the case of adultery, last time I checked, it takes two, right? So God's provision under the Old Covenant was for both offenders to receive charge. And this is why John tells us in verse 6 that these guys, these Pharisees, these teachers of the law, they were not really doing this out of respect for the law. It's not like they have such a love for the law. that They need to do what's right. We need to do what's right. Because they weren't doing what was right. They bent the law to serve their own purpose. Had they done what was right, they would have brought both in. But they didn't. They were trying to trap Jesus in order to have a basis upon which to accuse him of being the lawbreaker. Why? According to the Jewish law, they were trying to trap Jesus in one of two ways. If Jesus had recommended mercy toward the woman they would have accused him of breaking the law of Moses, okay? They lived under simultaneously two sets of laws, the law of Moses and Roman law, okay? On the other hand, if Jesus had suggested justice by stoning, then he would have been violating the Roman law. So if he abided by the law of Moses and dealt with her sin by stoning, well, then he violates the Roman law because Roman law said Jews were not allowed to take matters into their own hands and perform capital punishment. So basically they're setting up him up for a lose-lose situation, right? What's Jesus supposed to do? What I love, I absolutely love this part of the story. Instead of answering their insincere, audacious question of what are you gonna do, Jesus? What are you gonna do? They, he, he didn't even need to answer. He didn't even speak a word. Jesus bends down and starts writing in the dirt with his fingers. He doesn't speak a word. How many of us need to take that lesson to heart? We talk a lot. This is a noisy culture. Sometimes you don't need to speak a word. Those people in your lives that drive you crazy by the things that they choose to do in their behavior, you don't need to point it out to them. Sometimes they are very aware Sometimes they are dealing with self-condemnation and guilt. And the last thing they need is their friend pointing it out. Sometimes you don't need to say a word. 
he bends down and he writes in the dirt. And instead of dignifying them with a response, he just decides to answer with the divine authority, the same divine authority that Yahweh had written with his finger on stone tablets of the law, according to Exodus 31, 18. And of course, this begs the question, we all want to know, what did Jesus write in the dirt? What did he say? What was he writing? Have you ever wondered about that? I have. I've heard numerous speculations, and I certainly don't know for sure. We may never know. But I'm going to just go ahead and give you a few options. This is just from me. Maybe in order to confront their self-righteous facade, maybe, just maybe, Jesus was jotting down the names, their names, the names of the Pharisees and every law teacher gathered there. Maybe he was writing their names, complete with the dates and the times that these very men had made their own appointments with this woman. Because the Bible indicates that this wasn't a one-time occurrence with this woman. She probably was a prostitute. Think about that possibility for a minute. Or perhaps maybe it was just more general. Maybe he was writing just some general things. Maybe it was a list of some of the most obvious sins in these men's lives. So that he could expose them in a similar way that they had chosen to expose her. Whatever the case, we know that Jesus was writing in order for their bony little fingers to have to point right back upon themselves. And when they saw that Jesus had some dirt on them, they dropped their stones and left. You see, the law actually prescribed, according to Deuteronomy 19, get this, that those wishing to stone a person for adultery had to be innocent. They had to be innocent of the crime themselves. Where were they? They left. The ones who cast the first stones had to be morally upright before they were allowed to condemn through capital punishment. So this even further expands the picture for us about what's really going on here, you guys. Think about this. These self-righteous, inhumane, so-called spiritual leaders began to drop like flies when they realized, uh, we're living in glass houses. This dude has something on me. I got to get up out of here. I don't like this one bit. And is it a wonder why they hated Jesus so much? Not only did he repeatedly claim to be God, which was blasphemy to them, but he actually had evidence to back those claims. He also knew about them things that they couldn't explain. And he drove these religious leaders crazy. All the manipulative control <clears throat> that he had worked so hard to achieve, or I'm sorry, that, that they had worked so hard to achieve over the average Jewish population was being exposed for the scam that it really was. And these Pharisees, these teachers of the law, started to freak out. Their world, their scam was being exposed. It was falling apart. And they were flailing. They got up out of there. This is what man-made religion does. But Jesus, who's full of grace and truth, he doesn't play by man-made rules. He cares about the heart. He knew how to deal with these guys, but he also knew how to deal with the woman. Jesus never came to start a new religion. People had plenty of religions in that day. It took, and, and look where it had gotten them. Look. It got them to the place where the Pharisees were at, right? They would just simply walk on the backs of the Jewish people to get what they wanted, to get, position themselves high up on this ladder of hierarchy, spiritual hierarchy. The ones who were supposed to be shepherding and caring for their souls had sunk so low that a gang of them would parade a defenseless woman out in front of a public crowd. Why? to serve their own agenda. They didn't care about the woman. They wanted to, tra to trap Christ. They were trying to set a trap for Jesus to serve their own agenda and getting him off the scene. They didn't care about this woman, but they humiliated her in the process. That's unthinkable. That's demonic. I mean, there are ways in which the New Testament directs us on how to confront ongoing sin when necessary in a gracious and humble way. And I know that many people 
will say, Calvary, you guys, you guys are just really soft on sin. You guys always talk about good news and how much God loves you. And, you know, you guys don't really put any emphasis on the importance of dealing with sin. I'm pretty sure that God dealt seriously enough with sin. So serious, in fact, he sent his son to take away the entire sin of the entire world, past, present, and future. It's not that we turn a blind eye, but we don't condemn in order to do so. Jesus turned their dirty tricks against them. And so they've all bolted. Now it's just Jesus and this woman and perhaps maybe a few stragglers who were curious to see, okay, how's this dude going to handle this? What's he going to do? And Jesus says basically in verse 10, who condemns you now? Who condemns you now? That's what he says to this woman. And can you imagine the woman's facial expression as she's getting ready to answer Jesus' question? I mean, think about it. She probably was a little apprehensive. Like, is this a trick question? Are you about to now stone me? Like, did you get all these guys away to deal with me? Or she may have been like, this dude just put his neck out on the line for me. I'm sure there was an expectation of hope that her life was going to be spared, right? I'm sure she was relieved. Could this guy be for real? She had to have thought that. What's the catch? And she answers him, no one, sir. And actually, a better translation of sir in this context is Lord. I think she had a revelation in that moment. That was her Savior. Literally, practically, but literally, eternally. That was her Savior standing right there in the flesh. He had saved her life in that moment. And she knew no one was there to condemn her. And before we get into a few practical takeaways from this passage, I want to first speak to our own hearts right now. Because the truth is that no one, not one of us in this place, are sitting here able to boast of being without sin of some kind. No one, none of us. I don't, I don't care how righteous you think you are. We all struggle with stuff. We all do. Our spirits are 100% perfect. My spirit can't get, I am so perfect. It drives people nuts when I say, oh, I'm perfect. My spirit is. My mind, on the other hand, that's a battle every day, every day. But the bottom line is you have no idea what another person has been through. And while that doesn't minimize the fact that sinful behaviors like bullying or adultery or lying or cheating, they need to be dealt with. But at some time, we have to start understanding that we don't deal with it from the perspective of self-righteousness or judgmentalism. Because on any given situation, but for the grace of God, there we go. Who do we think we are that we can stand up and condemn everybody else? Well, I would, I would have never done that. I mean, I would have never done that. Did you see what she did? I would have never done that. But for the grace of God, you may find yourself in a similar situation. None of us are perfect. We are all dealing with our own fallible ways. So what are a few takeaways from this great story? How does Jesus model what it looks like to earn the right to be heard in people's lives so that we can have meaningful God conversations with them? That's the story here. Jesus disarmed the woman, built trust, and spoke to her life. To be certain, this woman had clearly sinned. There's no doubt about it. I'm sure she's standing there naked or barely clothed. What's she going to do? Ah, uh, I wasn't doing anything. Yeah, you were. There was no way talking herself out of it. She had sinned ultimately against Jesus, her creator, standing right beside her in the flesh. And what we learn from Jesus is stunning when you think about it, because it's exactly what our culture needs to see from us today. So what do we do? How do we follow Jesus' example? Okay? I want you to write this down in your notes on your app. Under God conversations, earning the right to be heard. You're going to see that on your app. Number one, the first thing Jesus does is rather obvious Remove the condemnation. That's what he did. These audacious accusers were sent packing by the holiest man who ever lived, standing there in defense of this woman. Interesting. We think, wouldn't we think that Jesus would have sided with the teachers of the law, the spiritual teachers of his day? Instead, he was concerned about the woman's condition. By writing on the ground, writing whatever it was that he wrote, Jesus was exposing the fact that sin is sin. 
period. And I want us to think about that, the contrast between the way Jesus related to this woman and the way that many present-day Christians relate to modern culture. Since the rise of fundamentalism in the early 20th century, many Christians have taken this warlike posture toward the world. And I'm not saying that spiritual warfare is not a real thing, because it is, 100%. And Satan is a real entity, and there's no doubt about it. He is leading millions of people the best way he can away from the Lord. But in this war, we're told many times in many ways in the New Testament that the weapons we fight aren't the weapons of this world. Our weapons are weapons of love, not hate, of compassion, of exp and, and they're expressed through the humility and the kindness of grace. The enemies in this warfare aren't people. We forget that all the time. We feel like we got to get in people's faces and yell and scream and tell them all the things they're doing wrong. And God says, no, our weapons are love and humility and compassion and grace and mercy because he cares about people's hearts. Jesus knew the best way to help this woman would not be to win the argument, but to win her heart. He cares about our hearts. After Jesus removes the condemnation from her life, he's able to then move on to a meaningful conversation. So that's the next thing that you can write down in your notes. Number two, engage in conversation. As soon as the dust settled, the Pharisees took off. Jesus says to the woman, where are your accusers now? Can you imagine Jesus? Just think for a minute. Just make him human for a minute, not just a story character. Think about his facial expression now. He asked this question, can you imagine the mischievous twinkle in his eyes? When he asks, knowing she can only say, there are no accusers. He was setting her up for the best proclamation and declaration. It's like he was saying to her, did you see that? These guys aren't so scary after all. I just gave them a taste of their own medicine. And Jesus, by removing condemnation from this relationship with her, earns a conversation with her. He earns a conversation with this woman who, by the way, should never, ever, ever had been speaking to a rabbi, a male rabbi in public. I mean, Jesus is breaking rules all over the place, and I love it because they're man-made rules. They're man-made rules. We make a bunch of rules up, and we change them all the time to fit our situations. He didn't care about those man-made rules. So he engages with her because, again, he cares about her heart. This is the beauty of Jesus. Back to John 1.14. Full of grace and truth. We can be full of grace. Full of love. Full of acceptance. And full of truth of our lives. That's what will eventually be embraced by those who need change. I'm so tired of people running around trying to force feed, change, trying to act like we're the morality police. I'm so tired of believers assuming this role. Please just stop. Please stop. I think God can take care of people's sin. This is one of the many stories of the Gospels of how Jesus was a true friend of sinners, a friend who is sometime, someone who loves you, right? A friend is someone who welcomes you unconditionally with all your hurts, with all your habits, with all your hang-ups, Without friendship, sin can never really be confronted in any meaningful way because people are not going to listen to someone that they don't trust. When I was in high school and my friend reached out to me to bring me to a point of confrontation, right? She had earned the right to speak to my heart. I trusted her. I knew she wasn't crazy. I knew she wasn't out for my demise. She wanted the best for me. She disarmed me, she put me at ease, and she earned my trust, which opened up a door for conversation. And third, we knew, we see that Jesus knew how to, number three, introduce the confrontation. In this particular case, Jesus encourages the woman with the fact that there's a better life available. That's the confrontation. There's a better life available. His words about leaving her life of sin were far more than just this moral command. It's not like he sat there and said, now go and sin no more. He was like, now go. You don't have to live like this. 
And we have no idea what led her to this lifestyle. Again, step back for a minute. You don't know what people are going through and you don't know what caused them to get to the point in their life that they're at right now. Think about your own life. Think about that for a minute. We are messed up from things that have happened all through our lives. What if people accuse us of stuff that we don't know any other way to handle life except for what we were taught? We're doing the best we can with what we've been given, right? We can defend ourselves in that, but when it comes to someone else, all the grace flies out the window. They, need, they know better. They know better. Well, maybe they don't. Maybe they really, really don't. Think about that. We have no idea what led her to this lifestyle. Was it because she never had a, a male father figure in her life to tell her she was priceless and loved and lovable? Was it that she had no provision in her life and this was the only thing she could come up with to, pay, to put food on the table for children? We don't know. And you know what? It doesn't matter. Jesus doesn't sit there and go, gosh, I really wish you were, uh, you know, worth something to me. But this whole past situation you walked through, like, oh, that kind of, I'm sorry, you're null and void. No. He says, I know what you've gone through. I know the decisions you've made. I still love you. I will move heaven and earth to get to you because I care about your heart so much. If I need to write on the ground and set your accusers running, I'll do that. It's fine because I care about you. Don't worry about me getting trapped. I, I, can, I can defend myself. I'm good. But I care about you. And you know what else he cared about? He cared about the Pharisees. He knew how to handle them too. They had the option to respond. They chose their own way. Jesus ministered to those who felt condemned and judged by religious people. Period. Maybe we need to start taking that initiative with that mindset. Maybe we're called to minister to those who feel condemned and judged by religious people. Maybe we need to be change agents. Maybe we need to start changing the reputation that believers have set. Please stop. Please stop. There are too many people that say, man, I really love Jesus, but it's his followers that ruin it for me. Please understand that I realize, God realizes as well, that we're going to make mistakes as believers. We are. I've certainly had moments in my community, in my circle, in my family, in my household, where I've been too short, where I maybe have crossed the line with my humor. My sarcasm can cut. But thankfully, Genuine humility goes a long, long way with people in our world, in our community. It goes a long, long way to people in our workplace or under our roof. I can't tell you the number of times that I've had to apologize to members of my own family. After 27 years of being married and 23 years of raising kids, there will be more apologies necessary in the future because as much as I long to live a holy life, I fall short really, really, really short, and I need grace extended to me. And I need to remember that when people do me wrong. And when people see in us the ability to admit that we ourselves are clay vessels, easily broken, radically fragile, and desperately dependent upon God's grace, we earn the right, we earn the authority to guide them to the crossroads of confront confrontation, about making a decision about their own need for Jesus. There's nothing worse than trying to act like you have it all together. Well, I don't want people to know. I mean, I feel like a hypocrite. Like if I don't, you know, stop. They already know you don't. What will disarm someone is by telling them, I am not, I don't have it all together. I don't. And I don't claim to be perfect. I make mistakes. I don't handle things correctly. But you know what? God loves me. He'll set me back on track. He'll renew my thinking and my mind. And you know what? He wants to do the same thing for you. Isn't that so much more appealing and sweet than standing up and telling someone all the stuff they've done wrong? Because I promise you, they're going to stiff arm you. They're going to walk away and go, Christians are whacked. They're crazy. 
They're jerks. If you're here today, you, maybe you've grown up in church your whole life, and you've been taught this mindset that we're to sit there and go off on people, throw tracks at them, and somehow we think we've done our Christian duty. Or that we have this mindset that somehow this is a deal closing sales pitch. And if we can just get them to the sinner's prayer, we're good. And we can just keep them from hell. But we have to remember this is a journey, it's a process. And there's just in your own life, think about in the natural things that you have come into understanding. It took you a while, right? You didn't get it overnight. There wasn't always this one pivotal thing. It's a process. Tend to them like a gardener would tend a seedling. Cover them. Protect them. How do you do that? We have ways to help you right here at Calvary. We have Grace Walk. We have Gospel Circles. I know you feel inadequate at times. You say, I'm not an evangelist. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to talk about it. Just tell them about Jesus. Tell him what he's done to you and your life for you. You don't have to have all these crazy laid out plans. Put the tracks away. Put the tracks away and simply tell him what he's done for you. If you're here today and you don't know that Jesus, you don't know the Jesus, the sweet Jesus who loves you, who will move heaven and earth, who will guard you in the middle of a public setting and say, where are your accusers? Maybe you don't know that, Jesus. I would love to pray with you today. I would love it. You don't have to go on in the mess of life that you're trying so desperately, struggling and striving to make right. Jesus says, I got you. I provided everything you need to live an abundant life. That is good news today. If that's you this morning, even if it's not, out of respect for the people that are sitting around you, they don't need you staring at them, making, you, making them feel all weird. Just close your eyes. I just want to pray with you today. Father, I thank you so much for every person that's here in this room, those of you that are watching online, wherever you are, not just physically, but wherever you are in your journey of faith today. Maybe you're just questioning a lot right now. Maybe you've had horrible experiences with so-called believers that have just pointed out everything you've ever done wrong. Father, I thank you that you are sweet, compassionate, full of grace. You extend grace to us. You clean our slates. And Father, we thank you that today we can absolutely acknowledge our need for you. And by simply saying, I receive the life of Christ today, all that you provided, thank you for forgiving me once and for all. Once and for all, past, present, and future. Thank you, Lord. You care for me. You have a future full of hope and expectation of good and not evil set before me. I receive that today. I pray for every believer that's here today that has possibly struggled with self-condemnation, that maybe they haven't done things correctly in the past. They've been too harsh or judgmental. I thank you, Lord, that you forgave them a long time ago and that you can renew their minds and their thought process to loving people, to seeing people the way that you see them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, church.